Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Death Row Executions. Today's video will be on two people who were sentenced to death and later found to be innocent. First on the list, we have Glenn Chapman. I'm just you know, absorbing everything right now, you know, processing. I'm still lost with the internet, you know. I don't see myself uh, in front of a computer trying to find anything anytime soon. Back in August of 1992, two prostitutes were found dead. The victims' names were Tanen Yvette Conley and Betty Jean Ramser. They were found about one week apart, and both were found in different abandoned houses in Hickory, North Carolina. Authorities believe the murders were linked, so an investigation began, and autopsies were conducted on both women. DNA from a man named Glenn Edward Chapman was found in Yvette Conley's body. Glenn was subsequently arrested, and he was charged with the murder of both Yvette and Betty. While being arrested, while in jail, and during his trial, Glenn maintained his innocence. He only admitted that he knew the women and smoked crack with them and had consensual sex with Yvette. Glenn's trial began on October 31, 1994, and prosecutors had no physical evidence linking Glenn to the two murders. The only evidence they did have was the sperm. Prosecutors also took time theorizing a story to come off as factual. They said that Glenn was the last person to see Yvette before her body was found, and the house that Betty was found in was set ablaze. Prosecutors claim that Glenn did that in order to eliminate any traces of DNA. In my opinion, it does not make sense for him to try and eliminate DNA from one victim, but not the other victim he slept with. In any case, two witnesses took to the stand, and they told the court that Glenn confessed to them that he had committed the murders. That sealed Glenn's fate, and on November 10, 1994, Glenn was convicted and found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. On November 16, 1994, he was sentenced to death. Glenn spent 14 years on death row. It later came out that the two witnesses who testified against him at his trial lied under oath, and they said the only reason why they lied was because they were afraid of police and the prosecutors. It also came out that Glenn's two attorneys were both alcoholics and did not do much to prevent Glenn from avoiding the death sentence, and they did not do well in presenting a defense. During Glenn's appeals on death row, he had new lawyers by his side, and they worked hard to prove that the prosecutors during Glenn's trial withheld evidence that would 100% have cleared Glenn's name from being attached to being a murderer. When it came to the victim Betty, a witness saw her go into the house with a man, and he took part in viewing a photo lineup and identified a man other than Glenn as the suspect. They were able to catch up with that suspect, and the suspect gave a credible confession. Prosecutors also claimed that Betty's body was burned when in fact it wasn't. The house was set on fire after her body was removed and taken in for an autopsy. When it came to the victim Yvette, witnesses said they saw her with a man she knew that was always violent with her. The autopsy conducted on Yvette concluded that she did not die of murder, but a cocaine overdose, so there should have never been any murder charges against Glenn for her murder. It took six post-conviction hearings within four years for a superior court judge to finally grant Glenn a new trial based on the fact that the state withheld exculpatory evidence and on the grounds that his attorneys were drunks and ineffective. This issuance happened on November 6, 2007, in a 186-page order. The district attorney ended up dismissing all charges, and Glenn was released from prison on April 2, 2008. In 2010, Glenn filed a federal civil rights lawsuit seeking compensation, and after a couple of years, he was granted a settlement of $1,025,000. There's going to be bumps in the road. Uh, get back up. Keep going. Slide around the bicycle. You fall off, get back on. You know, eventually, you're going to get it right. Next on the list, we have Robert Dubois. 
It all started back on August 19, 1983, in Tampa Heights, Florida. It was around 8 o'clock in the morning when 19-year-old Barbara Grams was found dead outside of a dentist office. Authorities were called to the scene and her case was considered a homicide because she was found with nothing on except for a tube top that had been pulled down, leaving her body exposed. By the looks of her face and body, it appeared that she was physically assaulted. Lead investigator, Detective Philip Saladino, also noticed that one of Barbara's fingers had a ring mark on it, but the ring was missing. Barbara was a hard-working young woman, and she worked just two miles away from where she was killed at the hot potato restaurant at the local shopping mall. Detectives spoke with her co-workers, and one co-worker let them know that Barbara closed the restaurant the night before at 9 o'clock p.m., and typically after she closes, she would walk home by herself because it wasn't a far walk to get to her house. Two witnesses, who also happened to be Barbara's friends, told investigators that they saw Barbara walking on North Boulevard Street at 9.30 p.m., and by that time, she was only a few blocks away from her house, and it was also a location that was past the dentist's office where she was killed. It was speculated that maybe Barbara backtracked in order to purchase some cigarettes from a convenience store close by, but no one will ever know why she made the trek back. After more investigating in the area in which Barbara was killed, authorities found two 4x4s with Barbara's hair and DNA on it, so they believed those were the murder weapons. Detectives also ended up taking fingerprints from an air conditioning unit by the crime scene, and they also took fingerprints of Barbara's wallet. The autopsy on Barbara's body was conducted on August 20th by Dr. Lee Miller, and the autopsy concluded that there was, in his words, white fluid in her vaginal samples. He also noticed a bite mark on her cheek and took saliva samples and believed that the DNA was from her attacker. Dr. Miller then phoned a forensic odontologist by the name of Dr. Richard Powell. Although it was Dr. Powell's first criminal case, he examined the photos sent to him by Dr. Miller and he told Dr. Miller that the bite came from someone with missing upper front teeth. He also noted that the six lower teeth had no gaps. On August 23rd, Dr. Miller took a cheek sample and placed it in formaldehyde in order to get a clear look at the bite mark because the tissue would shrink 10% in size. While Dr. Miller was conducting his own test, Tampa police decided to reach out to a different dentist who was a forensic odontologist in other high-profile murder cases. This dentist, Dr. Richard Silveron, advised lead detective Saladino to use beeswax to make bite mark impressions of potential suspects and the molds could be used to compare to the picture of Barbara's cheek. The beeswax was easy to access because Detective Saladino's police captain was a beekeeper. Reports say that Detective Saladino and his partner made over 100 molds for potential suspects, but nothing turned up. Detective Saladino had multiple suspects despite the molds not matching. There was a man who dated Barbara and a neighbor who had sold Barbara diet pills, but the investigation led to a dead end. Finally, Detective Saladino got a lead when he spoke with a woman who worked at a convenience store near the dentist office Barbara was killed in front of. Although she did not recognize any photos of Barbara, she told the detective that there were men around the area that caused problems, a Ray, a Robert, and a Bo. She then directed him to a house nearby, but when Detective Saladino made it to the property, no one was home. They searched the mailbox and they saw mail addressed to multiple people with the last name Dubois. After more digging, they discovered the mail belonged to two brothers, Victor and Robert Dubois. They also found out that 18-year-old Robert already had two minor nonviolent crimes and was currently on probation. This was a lead for Detective Saladino and he eventually met up with Robert on September 25th. While being questioned, Robert said that he heard around town that police were taking bite marks of everyone but he had nothing to hide and was willing to give them an impression of his teeth. Robert's parents were also questioned, and they said Robert and Victor were home the night of August 18th, but if they did go out, it was to look for their sister Myra Dubois, who was reported missing on August 16th and later found. Detectives were still stuck on Robert being their main suspect, despite him not having gaps in his upper teeth. Also, despite Dr. Silveron himself saying the attacker had missing upper teeth, he reported to Detective Saladino on October 21st that Robert made the bite marks found on Barbara. On October 22, 1983, 
Detective Saladino asked Robert to come to the police station so they could talk. Robert, not knowing he was going to be arrested, waited in the police station for an hour before he was met by Detective Saladino, who then arrested him. It was 3.20 in the morning, and Robert was charged with murder and sexual assault. The very next day, another mold was taken of Robert's mouth, and Dr. Silveron confirmed Robert was the attacker. While Robert was locked up at the Hillsborough County Jail, Detective Saladino got another lead in January of 1984 after another inmate by the name of Claude Butler informed him that Robert Dubois admitted to him that he, his brother Victor, and another man named Raymond Garcia sexually assaulted Barbara and then killed her. Detective Saladino believed Claude because Robert and Claude both had psychiatric issues and were in a small section of the jail that was specifically for inmates who were suffering with mental health issues. Even though Claude told Detective Saladino that Robert admitted other men were involved in the murder, he decided not to charge anyone else except for Robert. Claude, who was facing murder charges, was sentenced to five years in prison for his crime, and some say he received a deal for being a witness against Robert, but all claims were denied. Another witness by the name of Joanne Suarez told investigators that Robert told her back in August of 1983 that he killed someone but did not give a name or a reason why. She also said that she saw Robert with a ring similar to the one Barbara used to wear. A third witness by the name of Jack told investigators that back when Barbara was murdered, he was living at the Peter Pan Motel and it was the same place Robert was before his arrest. Jack said that he saw Robert at a party and was visibly upset. He asked Robert what was the matter, and Robert responded to him by saying that he was upset because he was wanted for murder. Twelve days after Jack told investigators this story, Robert's trial in Hillsborough County Circuit Court began. It was February 25, 1985. When trial began, prosecutors led with witness testimonies and a storyline that Robert was a violent, raging man. I already mentioned that the first witness was given a light sentence after his cooperation with the police, the third witness, Jack, was a witness in another murder case going on, and after his witness testimony against Robert, he was not charged for his other murder case. Joanne could not testify much because she suffered from a brain injury and could not recall much during trial. The evidence prosecutors led with was the bite mark left on Barbara. Dr. Soveron spoke with the jury about the bite mark. Defense questioned Dr. Soveron about the statement he made to detectives that he eventually admitted to saying, if you tell me that this is the guy that did it, I will go in court and say that this guy is the guy that did it. Dr. Soveron admitted to saying this to detectives, and it made it seem like the teeth composites truly weren't a match, and he was going with whoever detectives wanted to frame as their suspect. Defense then brought in their own forensic expert, Dr. Norman Sperber, who testified that Robert should be excluded as the source of the bite mark, and he should be innocent altogether, because no forensic evidence tied him to the murder of Barbara. None of the fingerprints taken near the crime scene belonged to Robert or anyone he knew. Detective Saladino took to the stand and swore that he had never seen Robert before. It turned out that that statement was a lie because he was a part of a sting operation that arrested Robert in the past for burglary. Robert was eventually found guilty of capital murder and attempted sexual assault on March 7, 1985. The jury came back with a recommendation of life in prison, but Judge Harry Lee Coe III decided to go against the jury recommendation and he sentenced Robert to death by method of the electric chair. Robert spent a horrific 35 years on death row and had to deal with numerous appeals being denied. In some appeals, they claimed that the cast of his teeth were based on an illegal search and that Claus should not have been able to testify against him in court because he was acting as an agent for the state. They also claimed that the judge abused his discretion when he overruled the jury's recommendation of life in prison. The Florida Supreme Court said it did not matter that the beeswax molds that were initially taken were not scientifically reliable because there were more casts made after his arrest that were valid and he consented to the procedures. Robert said that he was heavily medicated on antipsychotic medication at the time he consented and he was not in his right frame of mind. The appeal court upheld Robert's conviction, but they did rule that the trial judge did not give a proper regard to the jury's sentence recommendation, and Robert's sentence was changed to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years. In 2006, Robert requested post-conviction DNA testing, but all of the DNA evidence from his case was destroyed in 1990, 
and the court refused his request to test other items of evidence from his case. The court said that because he committed the murder with other people, any evidence missing would not necessarily prove his innocence. In 2018, when the Innocence Project started to investigate Robert's case, they discovered that the inmate who gave testimony against Robert, Claude Butler, his five-year prison sentence was reduced to time served, and he only spent a total of 13 months in prison. The Innocence Project then looked into State Attorney Ober, who testified in court. He was quoted saying, We made no promises to Claude. We did nothing for him. He asked nothing. So the Innocence Project found out that Attorney Ober lied under oath. He also claimed he never met with Claude Butler, but in actuality, they did meet before trial. This new evidence was turned in during an appeal on September 26, 2019, and the courts agreed to review Robert's case. In this new investigation, the National Academy of Science said that there was no scientific foundation to support the idea that human bite marks are unique or that skin is capable of faithfully recording those marks. Forensic odontology during the time Robert was originally investigated had since been discredited and no longer accepted as reasonable medical dental certainty. In 2019, Dr. Silveron recanted his testimony he gave for the prosecution during trial. A new doctor, Dr. Adam Freeman, explained that when the cheek tissue was placed in formaldehyde, it made the tissue sample ill-suited for comparisons and that the beeswax mold left distorted impressions. He also testified that the mark on Barbara's cheek was not even a bite mark at all so it was pointless to take any molds of anyone's teeth. In August of 2020, a supervising attorney by the name of Teresa Hall was able to find three slides from the sexual assault kit taken on Barbara that contained DNA samples. The DNA samples were retested, and Robert was excluded as a contributor. His brother Victor was also excluded, and the other suspect, Raymond Garcia, was excluded as a contributor as well. On August 26, 2020, there was a motion to reduce Robert's sentence to time served, and he was released from Hardy Correctional Institute that same day. Dr. Richard Silveron refused to give an interview, but on September 14, 2020, he did agree to give a statement to the Tampa Bay Times, and he said, There could have been a million other people whose teeth fit. What a ding dong. In October of 2021, Robert filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city of Tampa. Dr. Silveron, and all of the police officers involved in his case. On August 4, 2022, Amos Robinson and Abraham Scott were indicted on murder charges of Barbara Grahams and Linda Lanson. Their DNA matched the DNA that was found on both women and in the DNA evidence collected against Robert for his case. Thank you all for watching, and let me know what you guys think of these stories and the people involved in the comments Mr. below. Mr. Warren and Ms. Hall working with Susan Friedman. I mean, that's amazing in itself. You never find a prosecutor's office that works with the defense, ever. So it showed from day one that they only sought the truth.